The Nondescript Man Part 1 Stalking for Money It's September 5th, 2017 at 5.51pm and 15 seconds when I watch Eastern Daylight Time. This begins a long-form video on a long-term counterintelligence stalker whom I've dubbed Nondescript Man, since he has no distinguishing features beyond being a Caucasian white male about my height and age. He hangs around record stores. He's cast to my type, which is usually the Canadian Security Intelligence Service sending a spy your way. Uh, the, they usually work directly or indirectly with the RCMP on most issues and would have also been feeding information on me to the Toronto Police and Canadian government. And if nondescript man is not CSIS, he's most certainly Toronto Police feeding information on me to the Canadian government. You may be wondering why a stack of compact disc singles, a statement from the Canada Revenue Agency, and a notice from my former bank are all somehow intertwined. Well, they most certainly are, but let me give you some pretext first. Back in 1998, my mother was diagnosed with COPD, or Chronic Obstructive Pulmonary Disorder, also known as Chronic Emphysema and given a two-year prognosis to live, since it's a terminal illness. My mother lived alone, hundreds of miles away from me. She was divorced from my father, and I'm an only child. So one of the first things in my mind when I learned of the issues I'd be dealing with over this two-year crisis was how I was going to be able to manage it personally and financially with myself being as far away as I am. So my financial strategy was to turn an agency like the Canada Revenue Agency into a secondary creditor in my life, meaning that as all the emergencies and crises occurred financially with my mother, that all had to be paid and settled to move on to the next. And basically I was earning enough you know, to live on my own uh, with my independent contracting business. Now, I'd have to factor in what I'd be paying for, which would be the flights back and forth, which are expensive flights, the revenue I'd lose while I was away from work because I was a contractor. There wasn't any vacation pay or sick leave to buffer that. It would just be a drain of revenue. I'd have to pay for my mother's funeral, the service, the uh, casket itself, uh, the permanent care on the funeral plot since I wouldn't be to care for it myself and I also had to pay off all my mother's personal debts which she had accrued during her life and she was even eating into her own insurance policy to pay for those debts so when she finally did uh, unfortunately pass away uh, there wasn't even hardly any insurance left to you know recoup my expenses so my strategy was that I would keep paying the CRA installments for my taxes but of course I would have to keep the returns themselves on hold until I figured out you know the exact amount of money I owed minus installments for the years that I'd be dealing with this. Per the prognosis I should have been able to have been back in a revenue making mode with my business after everything was done in year 2001 which means there would have been 1999 and 2000 and the current year of 2001 to deal with and I just would have been in a revenue making mode take the money I owed the government mi minus my installments I'd been paying all along do all my returns and just file them all and pay them all off all at once so there wouldn't be a back and forth and any remaining interest I would just pay off you know when they billed me for it unfortunately once you're late for even one return with the CRA they have people start following you around. Not only their employees, but people like Nondescript Man. And why they're following you around is to get information on you from everybody you know. That includes your relatives, your neighbors, uh, your employers, everybody you know, to see if you're hiding income, turning your friends against you as informants, every trick in the book to make you look like you're some sort of tax dodger, which I wasn't. So this went on uh, long after uh, my mother finally passed away. Of course, when that happens, you're in a sort of depression uh, mode because you're the last person. You have no more immediate 
relatives in your family. You're on your own. Uh, you have to go through that. Uh, then in 2001, we had 9-11 happen, which uh, cut into everybody's you know, ability to generate revenue, not just mine being targeted by the government. But uh, the most brutal issue was that I couldn't earn enough revenue with my employers turned against me to pay off my taxes, and that's very deliberate. Now, around this era here, at the end of 2001, early 2002, at my main contractor, KPMG Inc., we suddenly had a new administrative assistant show up whose job it was to interface with every single thing I did. She was to see everything I was working on, to supervise it, to sit right next to me, to process my invoices, to mark down the, you know, my income, essentially, to report on everything I was doing. She turned out to be a government informant. She was probably earning extra money on the side as an admin assistant and giving everything she could about me to the government of Canada, the Toronto Police, RCMP, who actually ended up working on a file I was working on at KPMG. But the main thing is, is that she was my handler. She was my confidence swindler. She was there to keep me, you know, under, under lock and key, essentially. Along with Nondescript Man and along with, as it turned out, around 2005, the, you know, CSIS employee upstairs in Unit 1115. So three people earning full-time salaries, at least, off my miserable life. Hence, demanding payment. So, uh, to make a long story short, uh, cut to November 10th, 2003, at 4 p.m., I go to my bank. I'm still in this loop where I can't earn enough money because my contractor will not give me any work until I have to borrow money from a friend who's an informant, uh, she tells whoever her handler is, and then suddenly a new contract pops up at KPMG, and I have enough money to crawl along again. So that was going on until this date, of course. And I went to my bank, and I tried to do something, and they told me, well, your account's been shut down. They gave me that piece of paper, and they also gave me this. A requirement to pay from the Canada Revenue Agency it cites my business account, GST, which is 7% of my whatever I bill a client. Basically, the government turns you into a tax collector for them. And at 7%, they said I owed them over $57,000. So the bank does whatever the government wants. They shut down my account, gave me this paper. And you're probably wondering, well, you know, were you crazy? You owed them almost $60,000. Of course they're going to be, you know, looking into your life and sending people after you and, you know, investigating you as a tax dodger. There's one really, really big problem with that, is that these amounts are monstrous lies, and this amount is a monstrous lie. They just invent it. They invent an amount big enough to shut your bank account down. I mean, at 7%, I would have been like a millionaire which obviously I wasn't if I was having to reserve money to pay for my mother's funeral expenses. I mean, they can only invent an amount because there's no tax returns, right? They invented this amount. They shut down the account. You can't pay for a lawyer anymore to dispute these amounts. So you have two options. You can deal with the Canada Revenue Agency directly and give them all the money you have, or you deal with a trustee in bankruptcy who bankrupts you, and as a creditor, the Canada Revenue Agency takes whatever's left. And you might be thinking, well, this is all being done to, you know, bring as much revenue into the country so that the citizens of the nation can benefit from all the services the government offers. Oh, no, 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 no. It's designed to keep the pyramid of power in place, where people like me go, oh, woe is me, I didn't pay my taxes on time, and I didn't put my return in on time, and I went bankrupt and I was destroyed. And I go on the internet like this, and all of you, at least Canadians anyway, are compelled to pay your taxes on time. Because as we'll go forward in this long-form video, you'll see that it's not about that at all. It's about punishing people with what the CRA calls an equal amount of fairness, which is just treating everybody with a equal amount of unfairness, but because it's done equally, they call it fairness. 
So I take my little bank form like this, and I go for a bite to eat on Young Street. I do my regular routines, one of which is checking out Sonic Boom for their new releases. Sonic Boom have been set up where it's like Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday for the vinyl and the CDs and so on. And lo and behold, as you can see, this is the same day. It's November 10th, 2003. Are five scarce European CD singles from an act that informants at KPMG knew I collected. One named Marion Knoll knew, and one named Jennifer Poulos knew I collected this act. This is why they follow you everywhere and ask about everything. Five of these are waiting in the bins at Sonic Boom, which, of course, Nondescript Man knows very well. He knows the staff, he knows the manager, except he doesn't buy anything. Just like the now-defunct HMV and Vortex Records that he used to follow me to, he never bought anything. In fact, Nondescript Man is still following me to Sonic Boom Records as of 2017, which is 14 years of following me there, and I've never seen him purchase anything. So what happens is, I buy these CDs, because on eBay back in the day they probably would have cost with shipping and currency exchange maybe $30, $30 each, maybe they still do. But of course Sonic Boom marks them down, since it's a honeypot, at $8 each. So it's just $40 in tax, which is nothing for these. So I buy them on my credit card, since I can't get any money out of the bank. And on I go. Then, the informants at Sonic Boom Records contact Nondescript Man, or another handler. They say I've spent $45 on CDs. The Nondescript Man calls Canada Revenue Agency and says, Oh, he's not in any crisis financially with, you know, what he's gone through. He's just frivolously spending money on, on compact discs. So, yeah, one of my informants just radioed that in. And then the Canada Revenue Agency and CSIS and others involved, escalate your targeting. And then your apartment goes under surveillance. Literally, all your activity in it. Uh, with me, it was electronic harassment. The skits at KPMG Inc. and now communications increased. Those are two of my contractors, big contracts. Until I had to resign from KPMG to get away from the entrapment skits. And then when I resigned, I got hit with the electronic harassment went psychotic, and had to resign from now communications. And the only, of course, recourse then was to just declare bankruptcy, which was the intent of the CRA all along. And, of course, with the electronic harassment and the you know, need to go to a psychiatrist, which I requested, of course, they intercepted that call and sent me for a drug test instead with the Toronto police. This is why the government of Canada needs people psychiatrically diagnosed with, in my case, four different mental illnesses, because you go, oh, the government does all these things to you, and they go, oh, no, 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 he's crazy, that guy's insane, he's got all these diagnoses, uh, there's no way we do this to our citizens, just to get rid of them. So, the day after I received the requirement to pay, on November 11th, 2003, I personally visited the CRA and showed them my draft tax returns and that most of my GST had already been paid down in installments, which reversed the CRA-invented freeze on my bank account that same day. Guess how much GST I owed when I went bankrupt, finally, in 2008? Zero. I owed them not one penny of GST. And you know what this proves? with what the Canada Revenue Agency and CSIS, and let's just say the government of Canada has done to get their money, which is their highest priority. You may think it's giving you services and keeping you safe. No, the government of Canada's highest priority is taking in money to pay for their middle-class incomes based on you breaking your backs in labor and taxation. Rest assured. What they proved after all these tactics, after all the harassment, putting me in a mental hospital, having me lose my career, turning everybody I knew against me, that if I had dodged tax or falsely reported tax, which I didn't do, if I had delayed my paying tax, if I had been late with a return or two, it proved that all of it would have been an act of human self-defense against them. 
And that is why Canada is a de facto mafia state. OpCatalyst.net Truth is criminal.